Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here today with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing today? Good. Good. Stanley Cup playoffs are on. The Oilers are out, unfortunately. The election's over. It was a very busy month of May, mm-hmm. but uh, uh, things are slowing down a little bit news-wise. Um, and not particularly fast news-wise for the Evans and Oilers, Bruce. Hmm. And I don't expect that's going to really change. Um, usually there's been a lot of news, even in the decade of darkness. In fact, in the decade of darkness, most of the news happened in late June. You know, who were the Oilers going to take with their high draft pick that year? This year, it's not going to be that way. The Oilers don't have a first-round draft pick. Um, and it's shaping up that they are not going to be doing much in the free agent period, and we'll get to that. So today, Bruce, we're going to talk about a number of things. We're going to evaluate two different players on the keep, hold, or fold system, which is Kleem Kostin and Matthias Janmark. We're going to talk about the Oilers' uh, signing of defenseman Phil Kemp and their trade for Red Deer wrestlers. Is it wrestlers? Rebels. 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 Wrestlers is another incarnation. Yeah, is there was a Red Deer wrestlers. The there was a wrestlers before. Ago? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but we'll talk Rebels, about their theme song is Billy Idol's Rebel Yell. Every time they come on the ice, they play Rebel Yell. So you can't forget. <laughs> At least it's not the profane version of uh, Moni Moni. All right. Um, we will have, uh, we'll talk about Nathan Groob. Grooby. Mm-hmm. I don't know how to pronounce his name. Yeah. Nathan Grooby, um, f- who was acquired from the uh, Red Deer team, mm-hmm. uh, from the New York Rangers. Yes. Um, and we'll talk about the Oilers offseason just a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um What's what's shaping up? Because there's just what there's one more indication that we're not going to see a lot happening. Okay, um, clean cost and Bruce, you wrote about you wrote a post about mm-hmm. him today. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, this podcast will be running through the week, but uh, today right. is Monday. Um, they're in an inter- interesting position with him. What is your take? Keep, hold, or fold? Yeah, uh, my take is keep, and. You know, and ideally keep by signing this guy before it gets to the end of this month so that he doesn't, you don't have to go through the process of issuing a qualifying offer and then hoping that he doesn't decide to go to arbitration because losing an arbitration case would be devastating for the Oilers if it was, you know, if there was a significant dollar difference. So ideally they find a figure that they can agree on and go into it with some cost certainty. Uh, this is a player who very much earned a raise this year, but uh, there's not enough, not a whole lot of extra cap space to be to be uh, handing around. Uh, that said, uh, this player was a massive bargain this year. I compared him to uh, early Zach Cassian, who I think is a decent comparable for what the guy brings, uh, except for this guy came in at the NHL minimum salary. Uh, was acquired in a minor league trade just after uh, the waivers. He'd been waived by St. Louis. Dmitry Samorkov had been waived by Edmonton. And then the two GMs decided on a change of scenery trade. And uh, based on the, well, the one year left on his actual contract, the Oilers won that trade convincingly because Costin was a fairly significant contributor to the Oilers this year, I would I would say. Uh, you know, he scored 11 goals, 10 assists, all at even strength, and almost all in the bottom six of the batting order playing 10 minutes a night. He scored 2.22 points per 60, David, at even strength this year. That's an excellent number for just about anybody. The order's been crying for top six wingers to score at that rate, let alone a guy that's down the lineup and, you know, typically on a, on a line with, uh, uh, you know, pluggers. Uh, and that aside, like he brought a physical element that the Oilers desperately needed, and they needed it all the more desperately when Evander Kane went down to injury. And as it happened, that was the that was the move that freed up the roadblock on the salary cap front, and it allowed Ken Holland to call up Costin and Matthias Janmark 
both at once and those guys came in and they just hung on grimly to their jobs for the rest of the year but Jan uh, Koskin and playing 57 of the 82 games I mean this is a guy who didn't play 25 games he led the Oilers in hits he led the Oilers in fights he led the Oilers in penalty minutes and now, depending on what kind of fan you are, you might say, well, those aren't all good things. And, you know, they're all double-edged swords, to be sure. Uh, but you got to have a guy or two in your lineup who can do those things. And if he can do them by, while being a plus-12 player on the bottom six line at NHL minimum salary, well, that's a win, you know. So to me, you know, the... the the trick is going to be finding the crafting the deal that works for the player and the team, whether it's a, just another one year extension, whether it's, a, you know, the security of a two year deal is still going to have to be, you know, I mean, they can't give the guy 2 million, even that's got to be one point X. And, you know, I, I, even though he's got this good season under his belt, he still doesn't have the, um, you know, he doesn't have the history uh, of, of playing in the league other than, you know, this, this one decent season, I think he's still finding his way and establishing his level. And as I wrote at the bottom of the piece, there may be a big money contract in Costin's future, but it won't be this summer. Well, not in Edmonton. It won't be right. Well, but he, he's, he in theory is an RFA target. Is he not? Yes. Absolutely. I mean, if you're Costin mm-hmm. and you know, if we look at the last three years, and you didn't play that much in the NHL outside of Edmonton, I'd like to try to go, like when I'm looking at points per 60, more than one year if you can. Yeah. Because um, in one year, it can, it's, can be misleading. So in the last um, three years, Costin's played 99 NHL games. So half of those would be in Edmonton, right, this past season. Um, yeah. Martin so yeah. he, he's at 1.8 mm-hmm. for the, that entire time period. Right. So if it was 2.2, 2, uh, it's, it was pretty low before then this season. Mm-hmm. So we can see why he was traded by St. Louis. But it's still at 1.8 over the three seasons. And that's a really good number for a, for a mm-hmm. winger, a physical winger. Yeah. By comparison, Zach Hyman, last three years, two point, Zach Hyman ranks uh, 67 out of uh, 451 NHL forwards who've played at least 800 even strength minutes in the last three years, 67th. And he's at 2.17. Uh, Evander Kane's same, six, r- ranking 60, 66, 67. He's at uh, 2.17. Connor McDavid is fourth overall the last three years for even strength scoring in the NHL uh, for forwards, two po- uh, for all players, 2.9 per 60. Leon Dreisaitl is 25th at 2.5. So Costin is is he's fifth on the list uh, for Oilers forwards um, during that time period. Kyler Yamamoto, by comparison, is 301st at 1.4 per 60. Ryan Nugent Hopkins uh, is 215th out of 451 at 1.65 per 60. So here's this guy, young guy, who can hit, who is willing to fight who puts up, who's got a good shot. You know, I don't think we can count on, an NHL team can't count on him, but I could see another NHL team thinking, three years, two million? Damn straight, if we got the cap space, why not? What are we going to give up then? Like a third or a fourth round pick? What's I don't even know the compensation. Um, it's, I think it's, let me just see. Not necessarily it. that much, but they, they, I don't see him going for an offer pick. I do see him going for a trade. You know, for his rights. Uh-huh. And of course, they only last till June 30th. Like an offer sheet. I mean, generally the league, the rare offer sheets that do happen don't happen for third or fourth line players. They're for, I know. you know, guys that are a little higher up the food chain. And, and uh, anyways, we'll, we'll, uh, that, that's going to be the crucial question. You know, if they could get the guy at 1.2 million, hey done deal but that may not be so easy and and uh, i don't know who his agent is to tell the truth he already so, had a signed uh, contract when he came yeah. here anything between 1.4 million and 2.1 million is a third round pick well, yeah, okay so you just have to give up a third round pick to get this player i mean that yeah. you know if you have that that's nothing um uh for a player of costin's 
um, ability right now. I mean, mm -hmm. he's worth, you know, so, and, and the second round pick is 2.1 to 4.2 million. Right. Anyway. Um, yeah, I, I'm definitely in the keep camp. Um, you'd like to see him before you splurged on the player, like give him back to Cassie and what did Cassie get four years at 3.2 million. Yeah. Uh, a little further along, much yeah, further along, much further career, along. actually. Yeah. But you know, if if it'd be nice if you know if the owners could sign this guy to a two-year deal at one point five million or one point three million, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, That's true. What it would take, mm -hmm. but it'd be nice to get him on a two-year deal. Yes. And um, I mean, I saw Bruce is he he played okay in the regular season as a two-way player. He was he was pretty good for a third or fourth line mm -hmm. player. He at least yeah. okay. Let's say okay to good as a two-way player. He was he crushed it in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he didn't make a mistake on a grade A shot against wow. in the playoffs, according to our. He was the he was the order's best like two way winger, according to our analysis. Mm -hmm. Now he wasn't playing any kind of tough competition, right? But in terms of playoff mistakes, if you're thinking of playoff mistakes, the failure to elevate Costin to align with maybe um, Drysaddle and Nugent Hopkins over Yamamoto by Woodcroft. If you're looking just at performance, who was playing well and scoring goals and making hits, and now he might have been. There was a talk that he was hurt, and he didn't. He did look like he maybe slowed down a he bit. Had a couple of three-minute games, which didn't make any sense to me. But unless he was hurt, yeah. So we don't we don't know that. We can't say that. Right. But if he was healthy, I mean, that's they should have played this guy. Get, given what Yamamoto was giving game in out game out in the playoffs, they should have elevated Costin. I mean, he earned it in the playoffs, and he's earned another contract, definitely. Like, there's just no doubt about it. And if they can get him on a two-year deal, um, that's what I would like to see. You know, his um, players tend to lose that rambunctiousness and that fighting edge as they get older. You get to be about 30, you don't want to fight too much anymore. It's a rare player who's willing to keep fighting at yeah. age 30. And um, Cassian, yeah. he, I mean, he just got, he started to get beat up, beat repeatedly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Once. And it's almost to the point where he didn't want him to fight. So Absolutely. I think Cassian isn't a bad comparison. But Cassian at 25, when he first got to the Oilers. Yeah, that's the comparison um, I'm making, not to the 30, yeah. 31 year old Cassian. Because I could play he hard. got paid more, but he played, he wasn't as effective as a, uh, at least in that particular role of a, of a uh, rambunctious stir things up kind of player whereas Costin's a I think it's pretty decent comparison to the young Zach Cassian uh, yeah also acquired at a, as a, at a in a trade of a you know change of scenery trade Cassian for Scrivens I mean it was the same yeah. as as uh Costin for Samorkov in some crucial respects yeah and in both cases the Oilers won the trade and you know Right away, the player they got started to help their team, and the guy they gave up didn't do a whole lot. So, uh, you know, a good good um, uh, bargain basement trade. There are those out there that criticize Ken Holland for how he acquired Clem Cost and claiming that he could have had him for free on waivers a couple of days earlier, kept some Orkoff, uh and uh, gotten cost in for free. But my take on that is this was a minor league trade of players, uh, and by definition, minor leaguers have cleared waivers or don't have to clear waivers. And uh, once this deal was done, then you can turn around and, and look for, uh, you know, another, another and Samorkov, they both cleared on the same day, October 7th to 8th. And on the 9th, they got traded for each other. Like this was... Uh, you know, almost seemed premeditated. But if the Oilers got Costin and they had to put him on their NHL roster right at the beginning of the season when their, you know, their roster was so tight and they'd have to cut some other guy that had, you know, been there all along. Like, to me, the part that gets forgotten in all this is the human relations part. Getting a guy on waivers, some other team's cast off, and then junking one of your own players uh, is not necessarily as popular a move as getting a guy, putting him in the minors for a while, let him prove himself down there, and then he's on the call-up list. And then when he gets called up, if he plays well, then obviously he deserves it. And that's that's what happened here. And to me, this was a you know a very good minor league trade as opposed to what would have been a 
kind of iffy waiver pickup. I mean, maybe you say, well, he, he makes the team. They they farm out Devin Shore and at the beginning of the season, and they're a tiny bit stronger. But, I mean, who knew what about Clem Costin at the beginning of this year? We know he played 40 games last year with four goals and five assists. And he, you know, he getting him when they did on this, you know, on the second opportunity. I mean, the very fact that he cleared waivers, uh, to me, that's a wake up call for any player. You know, you get waived by your team one day and all of a sudden, you know, you got caught. That's a slap in the face. Well, the next morning you wake up and you find out that all the other teams in the league said, no, thanks. We don't want that guy. Now that's a wake up call. And when you're going down to the minors after that, well, you know, usually he would have just gone down with St. Louis's farm team, but it's, it's time for a reset. And in this case, he got, you know, he got the opportunity, at least with a different organization, if not at the NHL level right away. And apparently he came in with the, you know, he got, got things going. He played OK down there in Bakersfield. And once he came up here, he was good. He really was. I mean, <laughs> him and Skinner pulled the Oilers out of the doldrum out of the doldrums at that time they needed the Campbell had got was not getting it done and Kane was out and they the orders were needed a physical presence and here's his cost and man he was he just set um oil country alight with uh fans being excited about his play and and um scoring goals so yeah I'm in I'm in favor of uh signing him the only you know there was I think some kind of rumblings um slight rumblings as the in mid-season about whether costin was practicing hard enough that kind of thing like whether he was just saying bruce um there was kind of rumblings wh- whether costin was practicing hard enough or was getting it right you know i just wondered if he was partying a little hard is what i would wondered and i that's just pure conjecture on my part i have no idea uh but i, I there was that kind of talk for a little bit so i don't know can't hear you. Can't hear you, Bruce. It does seem to be part and parcel with the player type. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, comparing it. to Zach Cassian, I mean, remember the circumstances he came to Edmonton under, and many of the, uh, you know, many of the in, uh, enforcer types, which I wouldn't quite classify Costin as that, but many of them have lived uh, high risk lifestyles. It's been the history, so. Who knows? But I, I wouldn't want to pin that on me here, a thing or two here and there on different guys. But uh, I mean, obviously, the team knows a lot more about than, that than you and then I on we, the Cold and, of and, Hockey podcast. Yeah. And maybe it was like little things like sh- showing up late for a few practices or like um, or or other things. I just just remember hearing some minor mm-hmm. rub, rumblings in that direction. But uh, mm-hmm. on the ice, Bruce, this guy was he, he was really good in the regular season. And then in the playoffs, he got better. And he scored some key goals, and uh, man, like, like I say, I think he he had earned a promotion, but uh, perhaps there was injuries that we didn't know about. All right, so we're both in the keep camp, yeah. and it sounds like if he signed for two years at a reasonable amount, neither of us would be complaining bitterly. Mm-hmm. Although I'm sure some fans would be, given the nature of some some fans. <laughs> there will always be bitter complaints about anything. There will I say. I, Holland acquired Klim Costin, who became a significant player for Edmonton at NHL minimum, and there were complaints. So, if there's one truism about <laughs> one thing you learn on the internet is that no matter what player it is, mm-hmm. there's always a handful of people who love that player irrationally and who hate that player irrationally, mm-hmm. and, and will just you know attack that player at every turn or praise that player at every turn. And then in some players, some players are, they really move the dial in that regard where there's like huge factions of fans, like half the mm-hmm. fan base is just crazy about the player. And then the other half can't stand him. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, yes, a pulley RV, for instance, yeah. would be, uh, would be the latest example of that. You know, Niall Yakupov was another example of that kind of player. There's these, uh, <laughs> Highly drafted forwards seem to be um, high on the list, although I'm sure it extends to other players as well. We're never like that, though, right, Bruce? We're always highly curious. drafted defensemen, also, David. Oh, we're, we're always one in particular. Who? Schultz? Justin Schultz? Oh, no, 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 Darnell Nurse. Oh, Darnell Nurse. Yeah, jeez. Huge factions. 
Yeah. Well, right now the knives are out for Darnell Nurse, that's for sure. Yeah. But uh, I think a few tweaks to that guy's game and uh, and he'll be right back on course. But he's he, he does have to write the ship. There's no doubt about it. He was he was not. Uh, he didn't play well enough in the playoffs. He wasn't good. He wasn't good enough in the playoffs. Agree, hundred percent. Yeah. All right. Uh, moving on, Bruce. Um, Matthias Janmark. So he's a player that um, there's a there's a faction of fans who don't like him very much, mm-hmm. and would see the Oilers prefer that the Oilers move on. And I can see that. Like he is a. Um, a uh, winger of a certain age, uh, a forward of a certain age. He's um, he turned th- thirty. He'll be thirty-one in December, and he's a uh, at this point definitely a bottom six kind of player. Yep. And that's an age where you're thinking bottom six kind of players. Hmm, you keep a close eye on them because if you see any drop in them, you want to walk as quickly as you can because they can't afford it. They can't afford to get a little bit worse and hang on the NHL. And some people probably think they saw that in the playoffs with Matthias Janmark. What they saw was a badly injured player who was trying to help his team as much as they can. He took a he took a shot off the shin pads, I think, L, early in the LA series, and he, he was out after that. And he was never this. He came, tried to come back a couple times, and he had a weird wipeout into the boards. And but Bruce, in the regular season, um, when you know, again, we chart one of the ways that we try to evaluate players is their is their defensive play. And we look at the mis- the rate of mistakes they make on grade A shots against. And in terms of tracking that, in the years that we've tracked that, and we've been focusing on grade A shots for about five years now, Matthias Janmark is the best Oilers defenseman in that category, and it is not that close. He, um, you know, of course he's playing the wing, which is less defensive responsibility than the centers, who have a lot of, dis- you know, tend to have a lot more. But he was seldom caught out on the back check. He was always on the right side of his man, and he won a lot of pucks on the boards. He was just super solid defensively. Um, and that, on, on the on the penalty kill, which wasn't that strong this year, it was the worst Oilers penalty kill in four years. In fact, they keep getting worse year after year after year from being one of the better penalty-killing teams in Dave Tippett's first season. They've now become one of the worst um, in the bottom third, at least. And um, they were in the playoffs. They were they were not that good either. But you, the um, over, it's it's and it's hard to rate forward statistically um, on the PK. We what we try to do is break down. Okay, who makes the mistakes on grade A shots against? Well, on the on the PK, they're playing a zone. They have to be playing. They can't play man to man because they're a man down. So um, it's. Yeah, and you and they all play different systems. Their systems vary. The tactics vary depending on the coach. It's really hard to to figure out um, who's to blame um, often, especially with the forwards on the penalty kill. But yeah. over a full season of play, and then, then there's also the sample size issue, which is really small. That said, over the full season, you can kind of get a sense for it. And over this full season, the best in the regular season, the best Oilers penalty killer for a forward was um ryan mcleod and um he he was the best by quite a bit then there was a group of other forwards who did pretty well and they included connor mcdavid matthias janmark Derek ryan and ryan nugent hopkins those those are the other guys who who mm-hmm. kind of hung in there held their own um you'd be looking at them coming back the other guys who got some pk yamamoto didn't do that well in the regular regular season although he did well in the playoffs so, um, yeah, Janmark, I think um, he's he is one of the guys that you need that they could use back on the PK. He is a really super solid defensive forward, and he he contributes a bit at least on the attack for a for a uh, checking winger. Um, you know, he's not great. He's he scores like a third or fourth line player at even strength, mm-hmm. but he does score like that. And he gets his 25, you know, 20 to 30 points a year consistently. And um, he can handle the puck. He can skate with the puck. He's a good attacker on the penalty kill with the puck. And, um, you know, he tied with, in terms of creating um, grade A shots on the attack on the PK. McDavid had had a, helped create 11 grade A shots on the PK. 
Mm-hmm. Well, so did Yatmark, and so did mm-hmm. RNH. So he 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 was dangerous on the PK. He knows how to attack. All those things put together, he's a good skater. Um, I I just think this is a really valuable defensive hockey player, um, and. If the owners use him properly on a checking line, if they actually develop a checking line that goes against the top forwards on the other team, mm-hmm. his value then is 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 raised. It could even be higher than that. And that's how I think he should be used. The owners should form a checking line this year um, to, to play against top competition and take some of the pressure off McDavid and Drysaddle in that way. And Matthias Janmark should be part of it. And I think you can get him at a at a you know a mil, for a million one. Um, contract as well. If he's willing to sign that, I would sign him in a second for the coming season. So he's keep for me. What about you? Yeah, well, there's no there's no hold on an unrestricted free agent. You either keep him or you fold. Yeah. And the only interpretation of hold to me is that you have him, uh, um, you're willing to sign him, but you have an upper limit on the price. Uh, and uh, you're kind of there, David, with, uh, you know, a lower price than he made last year um, because that's just the nature of the uh, uh, of the league right now, that lower tier players are lining up just to get contracts and they're, they're lining up to get contracts at closer and closer to the minimum salary from one year to the next. And Matthias Janmark himself is a perfect example of a guy who has made uh, uh, last year at $1.25 million. He priced himself out in terms of making the team at the beginning of the season. He wound up in the minors because he was 500000 over the minimum, which doesn't seem like much. And looking at his cap history, you know, he signed after his, uh, uh, after his entry-level deal, he signed one deal for cheap, and then he had a pretty good year. And he signed one year, 2.3 one year 2.3, one year 2.25, one year 2.0, and then last year with the Oilers, 1.25. So the price is dropping. And part of that, I think, is just the market dynamics that, you know, the fourth, the, the lower tier players, I mean, it's only a 500,000 over the minimum, but if you can replace that guy with a minimum player, that, you know, the margins are that thin. So he may well have to take yet another haircut, which he's done three years in a row now. Uh, as you say, 1.1, 1.0, who knows? I mean, the key for these guys is to get the contract. And he's, you know, he's in the pile of guys that in the NHL who, you know, he's not guaranteed to be an NHLer next year, whether he goes the free agent route or not. So he may, you know, decide and... At the same time, he's probably not totally thrilled with the fact that the Oilers did send him to the minors, and he may well just walk as a free agent, you know, just thinking, I want to go. They signed me to a contract to play in the NHL, and the first thing they did was send me out. And, you know, I mean, who knows what, what, I mean, that depends on almost what personality type he is, but uh, uh, he might want to sign a contract on a team where he's sure he's, you know, going to be in in the lineup. And that wound up not happening here, though, you know, I think all was forgiven by the end of the season. And uh, uh, his production, I mean, this is Matthias Janmark's last uh, five years now. 25 points, 21, 24, 25, and 25. So three, an average of 24 and a, a high of 25 <laughs> for the last five years. And so he delivered for the Oilers more or less exactly what you'd expect based on what he'd done yeah. previously. And 21 of those points came at even strength, and the other four came on the penalty kill. He had three goals, one assist on the PK. Uh, he and Nuge, the three guys you singled out, he and Nuge had four shorthanded points, and McDavid had seven. And they were the Oilers' leaders. And the Oilers, the, the one thing I, I disagree with, with you a little bit about the Oilers' penalty kill going downhill is that their net penalty kill w- was closer to okay just because they led the league in shorthanded goals. So as a, as a, as a, a diehard fan of the Oilers of the 80s, I personally approve of that method. Score shorthanded and, you know, you, you, 
you're at least making up for one of the goals against, and often you're turning a game in your favor with a with a shorthanded goal. But uh, anyway, that's uh, uh, he was a part of that, and he was able to finish, uh, you know, three times, which is a pretty good number of shorthanded goals in a, in a season. And uh, he had two last year with Vegas. Last year he had zero. He's had zero power play points. Uh, with both Vegas last year and with Edmonton this year, he just you know that's just not part of his game. He's a depth support player, so if he's willing to get paid like a depth support player, uh, you know, and I think definitely you do have to pay. You don't just offer the minimum or bust. But both him and Derek Ryan, you say, boys, we want you back, but we can't. You know, we're so tight on cap. Uh, you know how the market is, you know, you want an NHL contract, here it is, but it's a little bit of a haircut from what you got last year. I, I, there was, there was, there, I think there's recency bias against this player, like people who want him gone, they just, it's because of the playoffs, like, or, or, but hurt. there was people, but there were people who don't, didn't like him all season long, but I think mm-hmm. Woodcroft likes him. And I think if he had been healthy in the playoffs, he could have been he, like Derek Ryan. Like he's, he's that kind of smart hockey player. He and Ryan are, are really smart, studious, conscientious hockey players, veteran hockey players. And I think Janmark can help the Oilers win, win a Stanley Cup and would have. Losing him was not insubstantial in my mind. I know that people, that might not be a widely held view, but I think if he had been 100% and, and playing like he can, that would have made a huge difference for Edmonton. That guy can really skate. He's really smart. And we saw what Ryan did in the playoffs. How about another guy just like that? Would that have helped the orders? I, I think so. And, um, yeah, it's a shame. I think it would have really helped them on the PK, for instance. So I'm, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm would really like to see him come back. In fact, I'd rather have him in some ways. Like, I know, like, people like Bugstad and all that he can bring. You know, I wasn't that impressed with, in the end, with Bugstad in the playoffs. I, I didn't think he was great on the penalty kill. And I'm not sure that he is. And... He's a he's a good even strength hockey player, but he's not great. Um, and uh, he gives you a bit more on the attack, but he's not great from what I saw defensively. You know, he's okay. So we'll yeah, I mean, these are all fairly well rounded players we're talking about with yeah. Jan, Mark, Ryan, and Bukestad, uh, especially that are all UFA. Well. Janmark, he actually led the Oilers forwards in average ice time on the PK this year at 155 per game. Uh, and you look down this list and you see, well, here, here they are in order. Uh, Janmark, 155, RNH, 148, McLeod, 136, Yamamoto, 126, Mc, McDavid, who kind of got a bump this year, 114, Ryan, 112. And then you drop all the way to dry saddle 036 and Hyman 034. And I'm thinking, I don't mind that. You know, last year they, they played the crap out of Zach Hyman on the penalty kill. And really, what does that do for you, right? This year they took those minutes away from him, gave him some more even strength minutes, gave him the full-time job on the power play, and he racked up in the offensive zone, which is where he plays his best hockey, in my view. And... I mean, he he looks okay on the penalty kill, but you know, I would rather have depth players doing that. And uh, you know, I mean, it's not like Hyman's filling the net with shorthanded goals either. Uh, so, if you're able to to um, relieve some of your you know big minutes guys from playing those minutes, uh, then you're accomplishing something. Yeah. So yeah, Yamamoto's probably gone right i mean this seems to be the consensus and so they're going to lose his time on the pk and um i think they'll keep mcdavid out there though i think that that experiment worked very very well and, <laughs> and uh they'll keep doing mm-hmm. that but uh yan mark's not mm-hmm. a bad running mate for someone like Connor mcdavid so they, they ran nuge and, and yan mark together quite a lot as they I did and they were good they were pretty good i thought you and know connor played with uh sometimes i think uh mcleod yeah, yeah, that's two f- fast guys out there. Yeah. That's kind of scary mm-hmm. if you're the other team. Mm. So we'll see what happens there. Okay, Bruce, let's. Um, the owners signed uh, uh, Phil Kemp, who is an RFA, who has played um, his. Uh, he played hockey at Yale, 
uh, for was it two, three years, three years at Yale. Then he played uh, one year at Vasby, the COVID year he played at Vasby. Mm -hmm. And he's been at Bakersfield for um, essentially two and a half years. And this mm -hmm. year, uh, this past year, 21 points in 71 games for Bakersfield. Um, it's enough to give him a new was it two year deal. Yeah. What do you think of the signing, Bruce? Oh, well, I'm all in favor of signing that guy to uh, to a you know a two way deal, NHL minimum, uh, in case he gets a look here. Uh, but the Bakersfield organization, they're they're a little light on the back end. I mean, last year they went into the season. Uh, and with the right shot defenseman of uh, Phil Kemp, Michael Kesselring, and Vincent DeHarnay. Well, guess what? Kemp's the only one that's left in Bakersfield. DeHarnay got elevated to the NHL, and Kesselring got traded and elevated to the NHL, at least for a while. And so they've only got the one big right shot guy down there. They had Jason Demers, who's, I think, one and done. And so on the right side, uh, they need him. Uh, also, I think there's clear evidence that this guy is getting better. And in some ways, his 2022-23 season mirrored the 21-22 season of Vincent Taharney, uh, in that all of a sudden he developed an uh, offensive game. And not great, but he had six goals, 15 assists, 21 points this year, plus 12 uh, with Bakersfield. And in all of his years, like I'm looking at his uh, elite prospects page going back to 2013-14 with Brunswick School, USHS prep school, when he scored two goals in, in high school. And his six goals with one team in one season is a career high. So is his 15 assists in one season, a career high with any any uh, team that he's played with along the way. And this is the U.S. National Development Team or the Brunswick School or Yale University for three years and now uh, AHL guy. And DeHarnay kind of did the same thing in 21-22 uh, when he absolutely, let's just get the actual numbers here for you, Vincent. Uh, yeah, he finished seventh in team scoring, and he did kind of the same thing in that he went from, uh, like literally, he scored, he had zero minor league goals in two full seasons with base Bakersfield and Wichita, uh, better part of 80 games. And then all of a sudden, 21-22, he had five goals, 22 assists, 27 points. And he just dwarfed anything he'd done previously, basically anywhere on his resume. And it was just a, you know, I mean, boxcars are, are, they don't tell the whole story. But guess what? In the AHL, we don't got a lot of other stats. So that's a, a sign, at least, that the player is holding his own and then some at the minor league, especially if they have a nice big plus to go with it, which... Uh, Vinny was plus 36 in uh, 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 Bakersfield last year, and, and uh, uh, Kemp, Kemp soared in that department too. So we don't know yet what the upside is for this player. I personally kind of see him as a you know a good AHL defenseman, uh, but great. We need one of those. We need more than one of those, and you need one of those that you know if he's the eighth or ninth guy and he has to get called up in January because he got two guys hurt and. And one guy suspended or something, you know. I mean, you got a guy, so and give him a look, and and who knows what you got. I, I like his hockey smarts. He's got a very strong leadership. Uh, I think his skating is probably a little weak, and I ha I haven't seen enough signs that it's. I think on the NHL level, it would likely be exposed, which is why I'm projecting him as a just sort of a NHL player. But I've been wrong before, David. The um, the Deharney comparison is interesting. The one exception being De Deharney's size is just such a huge factor, yeah, he, right? He, in in evaluating him, he's just such a big man. Kemp's big, like he's what six three, two fifteen or something. He's big, but he's not Deharney size. And yeah, I agree. Just like Deharney, skating is the issue. Every time I've seen Kemp, that's what struck me. He's a smart player. Um, not he in 
when I saw him, which was mainly in his VASB year when he was right. in Sweden, yep. he, he was not that rugged, mm-hmm. um, but he was a smart player. And mm-hmm. um, so we'll see what happens. He was drafted way back in the 2017 draft now, Bruce. So yep. that's Yamamoto and Skinner. Seventh Samaruka. round, one year after DeHarnay got drafted in the seventh round. This is oh, why Stap- comparison Sapien. is kind of interesting. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Hero Maximov, these names from the past. And Skylar mm-hmm. Brindamore, who the Oilers didn't sign right. uh, to the consternation of some. Mm-hmm. Um not such a big deal in my view. I think um, that's where the Phil Kemp deal where the COVID hit and Yale's senior season got his senior season at Yale yeah. got canceled. That may be the reason he's an oiler because he wanted to play out his college career. He definitely wanted to be that captain and big man on campus, you know, in the last uh, year of his career. And then he'd been in the Skyler Brindamore situation. You know, you just wait until August and you can sign anywhere. And a lot of the uh, uh, players would if they play their fourth year, all of a sudden they're at high risk to ever sign him if they're drafted by a Canadian team in particular. So because he was kind of left out in the cold with nowhere to go and only any Oilers had the rights, he wanted to play hockey this year, sign here. And then they sent him to Vasby and then they sent him to Bakersfield. Maybe. So kind of worked out. but Well, he might not have gone elsewhere because everyone's different, right? You just don't yes, know. Of course. And he did just re-sign with the orders now. I mean, yes. if he was... Now that he could he's have here, signed he's theoretically elsewhere. Yeah, that's uh, true. Now, so he, so yeah, the, it's interesting. The, the owner's depth on the blue line, Bruce. They got Nima Linen from the 2016 draft is mm-hmm. still uh, got one year on his deal left, and now they've got Kemp. And in terms of like veteran prospect D men, that's it. And then, um, but there's a couple. So they drafted Luca Munzenberger mm-hmm. in the 221 draft, and. Mm-hmm. Um, He's kind of a defensive D-man specialist. He's kind of a big, rangy kid who can skate okay. And then they have um, the, just Bob Stoffer of the Oilers just put out his list of the top ten prospects as he under twenty threes. Right. Okay. And uh, Holloway and Philip Broberg were uh, Holloway was at the top, then Philip Broberg next. And fifth on the list was the defenseman Maximus uh, Wanner, who was drafted two hundred and twelfth overall. <laughs> Um, in the seventh round of the twenty twenty seventh round pick, he's a great. He's he's a pretty big guy, six three Maximus Wanner, six three, hundred and eighty five pounds. So strapping, I guess, is how you just des- describe that guy. Like he he's he'll put on some weight as he be, as he gets older. He had an he had an, a, a he had a good year, and then he got suspended. We still don't know why he got suspended, but he was. Uh, 30 points in 44 games. In terms of his his point production and, and what we were hearing from him, he took a big step up in terms of his play this season. Yes. So and he he did play in the playoffs. I see 10 games in the mm-hmm. playoffs, seven yeah. points. Yeah. So he he is in terms of him and Munzenberger are the the, the big hopes. And there's a Russian player Yasayev Nikita Yasayev. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure mm-hmm. exactly sure the pronunciation. Who was drafted this past year? Who played okay, I guess as well. For uh, bars, Kazan. Kazan. and he played in the KHL. He played 48 yeah. games. He got five goals, seven points. So for a young guy to play as much as he looks to have played in the KHL, 22 playoff games, uh, four points. He um, he's not as big, six one one eight one ninety, but uh, that's not bad for a, uh, a um, 18, 19 year old kid in the KHL this last year, Bruce. He was an 18 year old kid the entire pretty, year. He turned 19 impressive. on May 10th. Yeah. So, but you're right. Like, so the orders for years there, they had really good defensive depth in terms of prospects. And they still do have, of course, Philip Broberg, uh, is, is on the list, but he's now more of a known quantity. You know, we're kind of starting to, to understand what we're going to get with him. And, um, other, other than that, it, the cupboard's pretty bare. And, and, and until some of these players like Wanner or Munzenberger or Yasayev, Yev, Yev Sayev come up and uh, make a mark. Um, Bruce, Brian Lawton. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about what he had to say. Sure. Um, it was the biggest rave review of the Oilers organization I have heard since 2006. When they traded for Chris Pronger, Mike Pekka traded for Samsonov, uh, traded for Dwayne Rolofson. Um, there was lots of rave reviews of the Oilers back then. 
but Brian Lawton just let her rip. Now, Brian Lawton is, um, he's a fairly substantial, when it comes to commentary, he's a, he's not just an insider, he's kind of a, he's, he's kind of a player. He, he founded, okay. he helped found the Octagon hockey part of the Octagon agency. I'm not sure if it was the entire Octagon agency, but at least the hockey part of it. He was this mm -hmm. big part of that. And he um, was general manager of the Tampa Bay team when they drafted two key players, Hedman and Stamkos. Mm -hmm. And he... He was the he, Craig McTavish of uh, Tampa. That's right. And he... <laughs> McTavish drafted Drysaddle. Octagon now Anders, represents yeah. Leon Drysaddle, I understand. Yeah. Oh, cool. So um, that's, it's nice to hear an Octagon alumni praising the Oilers to high, have heaven. And here's... Here's what he had to say. He's talking to Bob Stoffer on the Oilers now. He said, quote, the Edmonton Oilers are no longer a place that you have to talk people into going to. They're no longer a place, in my opinion, that you have to overpay players to come or management people, for that matter, to work for. A lot of people don't realize how far up the chain Edmonton has moved. Their revenues are through the roof. That stuff doesn't get published, but I certainly am privy to where the organization sits. It is a completely different picture for the Edmonton Oilers than it was back in... Um, 0506. I think he actually means a couple of years after that. He right. says, when people ask me why I'm so bullish on Edmonton, it's because they're through those times. They're ready to explode. People want to play with Connor. They want to play with Leon. They want to play with so many guys, other guys on this team. It's a huge selling point. And even though it's not a uh, no state tax jurisdiction, players don't care. Uh, there's a group of players out there <laughs> that are players that you want in your organization. They're not a group of players that are mercenary. You don't want those guys. You want the guys that want to win. And that's what Edmonton is selling now. And he then talks about how in the summer he talks to uh, lots of NHL players about what they think of the NHL franchises, what the different opinions are, the different franchises. And I guess there's a lot of excitement about the Marriott Hotel, the Arena District, the or dressing room that, you know, the owner's dressing room, they're apparently palatial and some of the best in the NHL. And Lawton's quote on so that is the one for the road team, which is smart. Yeah. <laughs> His quote is, you can't believe the positive feedback I get on Edmonton. And that is a big reason I'm bullish on the franchise and it's not just hearsay it's not just lip service it's what players are talking about and why it's why edmonton is going to continue their rise up the ranks until they start winning championships and he talked about the, the you know assuming the oilers sign uh mcdavid and dry and he seemed sounded kind of positive on bullish on that so bruce that's quite a rave review um mm -hmm. of the Oilers organization and my fundamental take on on these is that there's been a lot of really hammering the orders organization um, in recent years. And I've always th thought it really doesn't matter what people say. What matters is what happens on the ice and in the negotiation room, of course, in terms of signing players. And McDavid and Dreisaitl both signed eight-year deals. And the orders are trending up as a team. But the, the praise doesn't matter. Lawton's praise doesn't really matter either. What matters is how this team performs on the ice. And, um, but I think the good news is, man, a few, a few pucks go a few different directions on the ice and they beat Vegas this year. In my opinion, I think it was super close between those. It wasn't like last year with Colorado where Colorado was clearly yeah. the superior team way yeah. better than the orders. This was so close between the orders and Vegas. The orders could have easily won that series. And mm -hmm. I just think it came down to a bit of puck luck and a bit of goaltending, and that was the difference. The turning point of the series may have been the play where Laurent Brassois got hurt, and they were forced to put in Aiden Hill. You know, well, that's he wasn't it, right? even their choice. And yeah. by the end, that guy's standing on his head and stoning the Oilers and clinching the series. You know, so it did. You know, the margin was was not great. I mean, the two teams were very close uh, at the end of the season, and they were. Close in the playoffs, and you're right. Vegas got uh, uh, maybe got a couple more bounces, and maybe the Oilers just didn't play their best hockey at the time they needed to. You know, so. What do you think of Lawton's remarks, Bruce? Well, he's. I've heard Lawton quite a few times. He's been on Stoffer's show a lot for you know quite a few Jeez. years now. So. Uh, and he's very much a positivist. He always speaks in positive terms and just about anything that he's he's speaking of, he's quite eloquent. 
And of course, he knows he's speaking to the Edmonton market, and so he says nice things about the Oilers. I mean, there's a lot of truth in what he says there. Clearly, the team has gone places. Obviously, the arena and uh, its surroundings are different, and the dressing room and all those kind of things that might entice uh, free agents. Uh, the issue this year being that those free agents who might want to play with Connor and Leon better be prepared to sign for. Uh, small uh, dollar figure because the orders you know this is we're going to keep going back to this they just don't have a lot of uh, uh, spending power this summer so they've uh, so anyway to specifically a lot I mean it's good to hear anytime you see an outsider saying nice things unless you're one of those who thinks well it's a jinx or it's a you know, it's BS or, you know, talk is cheap. I mean, all of those things. Or you hate Ken true. Holland. You hate, you're well, in the, yeah, 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 you're in the, right. you're in the, you want the GM hate, fired. Oh, so nobody gosh. should say anything good about the team until he's gone. Because <laughs> you could do a better job. Well, yeah, once I'm in charge, you know. It's, Not you, but was ever well, no, that. no, I'm, it's me now. Yeah, you can yeah, do But it. that's, but that oh, is that. kind of the, you know, the armchair GMs all want to be GM. Let's face it, we all want to see how we could do on that but uh uh lot was more than an armchair gm he was an actual nhl gm yeah so and he was a first overall draft pick and an nhl player and an uh you know a gm an agent like he's got a lot of you know breadth of knowledge so i certainly do respect his opinion he he did criticize Holland at the deadline. He thought Holland should have done a little bit more. Yeah. And he was very careful how he said that. Mm -hmm. But for Lawton, it was, you yeah. know, it was fairly significant criticism. I think he mm -hmm. feels like the owners probably should have made the Corpusalo Gavrikov deal. Is just my and I'm reading his mind here. Mm -hmm. But if I'm thinking of of what the owners might have done at the playoff mm -hmm. deadline that was different, um, picking up a goalie uh, might have been. The, the, although now the Kings are faced with signing Gavita, which is no easy matter, mm -hmm. and Corpusalo as well, I think he's, his contract's done. So we'll see what happens there. They got some tough decisions to make. It. I heard they're thinking of getting rid of Arvison was one of the reasons, and Arvison oh, yeah? was a really? player for them. Huh. Um, so Bruce, um, I'm going to be just writing another post on uh, just to finish. Oh, they, they made a, the owners made a, a trade this mm -hmm. week. We'll talk sure about did. That. Jaden Gruba, Gruby, mm -hmm. um, from Red Deer. He's a big center, 6'2", 200 pounds, I think. Um, kind of a point-of-game guy in his final year in the um, Western Hockey League. He's known, actually, for his defensive play as being a fairly good, good defensive player. So the Oilers, I think, are in, you know, when you've got the first and second line center kind of locked up, so to speak, um, and and even a, uh, a guy riding Nugent Hopkins, um, who's not bad filling in um, in second line center if someone gets hurt. They need they do need a really effective third line center. That could be Ryan McLeod. Um, uh, that might be the role that he will carve out, settle into, figure out. Like he's he's really got to buy into it himself, and the team's got to buy into playing him in that role um, as a shutdown center. But there's other competition for that role. There's Noah Philp, who just had a really strong uh, second half and is another great big right shot center. But this this uh, Jaden Gru Gruby kid, um, he looks like he's he's going to be – if Philp makes the orders uh, this year, which is not mm -hmm. would not be unheard of. He's 24, 25 now, and he's, he's played a lot of hockey. He's in the prime of his career. Um, Gruby could be – taken on the kind of a third or fourth line role this year in Bakersfield. Mm -hmm. They, tr they gave up a fifth round pick. There was yep. talk and it was from Puckpedia that if he didn't sign he him, they would lose him the next day. But I, I, I no. understand that was incorrect. He would yes. have gone back to the draft and that's right. why they made the trade. That's mm -hmm. why they actually traded a fifth round pick for him. To me, this was a really good trade, Bruce, in that, you know, I don't know anything 100%. about the player, so I can't speak to that, but you're speeding up your, your, McDavid and Dreisaitl are here for however many years, but you want to win now with the order. So this is, you're not waiting for a fifth round pick to develop. You've got a player who is a third round pick who's been developing and you're getting him when he's 20 years old, not 18. 
and he's he's a player who could fill a need. Now, there's some people who are saying the Oilers love them some uh, players with a low ceiling. But, I mean, you, you need all kinds of players to win in the NHL. And not all of them can be, um, are going to be on your first or second line. It doesn't mean this guy doesn't have some offensive skill. Um, he's a great big guy. And if he can shut, Bruce Oilers have a huge problem in the defensive slot with their centers. Mm -hmm. They've had it for years. They've got to, they've got to figure this out. They've got to get, that's one area of improvement they need to make. And I think we'll, we'll be making this coming year. And, um, he could be part of it, Gruby, not this coming year, but two or three years from. Yeah. He's going to be a project. He was a third round pick by the Rangers two years ago. So to get him for a fifth rounder. I mean, either you say, well, the guy's regressed and he's not worth as much anymore. But honestly, to me, it looks like the Rangers, for whatever reason, couldn't get him signed. They thought, well, we got to get something for him. And often you see these deals just right before a guy's rights expire and the other team gets them and they sign him right away, which the Oilers did same day. So here's what elite pro- prospects wrote about him before his draft two years ago. Uh, if there's a defining skill here, it's Gruby's defense. He's less aggressive and more quietly intelligent, eliminating off-puck threats, reading switch-offs, and constantly scanning and adjusting. In transition, he builds speed under the puck, pushes plays to the middle, and finishes his off-puck routes to create space behind him. So, uh, it sounds like he uses his size uh, not to bash people, but to create space out there and to cover. And all the reports I've read on him talks about how good he is defensively. And here's the thing. Uh, we don't know much about the player, but I can tell you this is something that you don't see very darn often in the junior ranks. In WHL, he's been the captain of the Red Deer Rebels for three years. Three years he was the captain of the team. And it's just very rare that a 17-year-old gets named team captain uh, unless that guy's like off the charts good, in which case he's on his way to the NHL before he turns 20. And this year, 67 points in 64 games, 16 points, 12 playoff games. And according to these guys, he's 6'3", 203. Yeah. So, yeah, he's a pretty uh, pretty decent uh, size guy already. And at 20, he's ready to turn pro. So they don't have to wait the two years for... And they can't afford to be waiting in the sense that they don't have enough bodies down in Bakersfield. Well, they just traded a draft pick for, you know, a guy who would have been 17 or 18 when they picked him later this month for a guy who's 20 now has gone through the junior program. He's shown steady signs of progression. I mean, his points per game total is here doubled. I mean, this is a guy who's, who's figuring it out. And so I think it's a good bet. I mean, what are you going to get with a fifth round pick? I mean, if everything goes right, you get a guy that maybe turns out in a few years. But I think they're two years closer to knowing what they're going to get, and uh, getting a you know a guy with uh, you know he's from Calgary, he played junior in Red Deer, he's come to Edmonton. I mean, what could be more Albertan than that, man? And in terms of like like I know the theory of drafting players who put up a lot of points. Like there was a mm-hmm. especially you heard this about six seven years ago. You want to mm-hmm. load up. People are really excited about this idea of loading up with all these junior players who who did a ton of scoring. Mm-hmm. And then you're hoping one of them actually can translate that into the NHL. And, you know, you don't worry about their size. You just look at their points totals and you'd base draft based on that. And I mean, this is an interesting theory, but what, what we've noticed, what I've noticed is, um, well, first of all, I'd say two things. The owners have lots of prospects for their top six. I mean, they have Dylan Holloway, who's a prospect for the top six. Yep. Raphael Lavoie is yep. a prospect and he might be top six or bust. He might be one of those guys. So um, there's, there's a, um, it's a, uh, it's not always, they also have um, Xavier Borgo mm-hmm. um, first, first pick from a few years ago. So um, you, you, they've got that kind of area covered a little bit at least, but they don't have big defensive center. They got up, they, you know, Noah Felt might be that guy, but what if he isn't? No. Um, they've got Tyler Tulio, who's going to be, if he makes the NHL, is likely going to be more of a third or fourth line player, possibly mm-hmm. working his way up. So they just, you need all kinds of players. And what you notice, if, if you just draft, you're going to spend a lot of time 
teaching these little offensive players um, who have spent the whole their whole hockey life with the puck on their stick um, to try to defend. It could be, it could possibly be that some people underrate defensive hockey. And then, you know, you get a player who can really defend and defend well. Mm-hmm. I, I, I also noticed that can help you win games. And the Oilers lost a lot of games because they couldn't defend. They've got no shortage of players who can do work magic with the puck on their stick. They don't have a lot of, they don't have necessarily a ton of forwards who are brilliant in terms of defensive awareness, defensive covering, like Derek Ryan is, like Matthias Janmark are. And um, I'm not against them. You know, it's not like his offense was non-existent. He's got some, mm-hmm. he's got a good shot. He's got some offensive mm-hmm. game. Bring in a guy like this and see, you know, you need in the core 12 um, players on a team. One of them is the third line center. And if it, that could well be Ryan McLeod for the next decade in Edmonton. But if it's not, you're going to need a, a series of candidates who can um, take on that challenge. And Phelps, one of them, and this guy's another. So I like the move myself. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I I like what I'm seeing and hearing about this guy, and it's, you know, especially his his leadership and his defensive play, and like I say, his offensive game surge. I mean, you would like to see that for a guy, you know, turning 20 during the season, but he, you know, he got decent points. He was named as the second All Star team in the uh, Central Division of the WHL, um, and you know, the verbal seems. Uh, uh, seems pretty darn good. So, and it's at least even though the Oilers traded yet another draft choice, and they only have three left now, the second, sixth, and seventh rounders in the upcoming draft. They traded this draft pick for essentially a draft, you know, a draft yeah. pick, a guy that's already been drafted. It's not like they threw it in on a trade because they had to buy down the guy's cap hit for the rest of the year, or they had to make a conditional trade because they were trading a draft pick they'd already traded before with a t- condition attached to that. You know, so often you see the orders lose a pick just because they're tending to some tiny detail. I know this is a pick where they used the pick, got a young player. Just like they would if they went to the draft, they just got it, you know, used it in a different way. So I, I don't mind that at all. If it's accelerating the progress, uh, the process a bit, great, bring it on. Bruce, um, let's just see how how long we've we been yakking here for. Quite a long time. Um, uh, the, hockey, hockey, hockey. The last thing um, I just heard uh, Ryan Rashog. Uh, talking on his his podcast, got your mm-hmm. back about um, he thinks the Oilers not going to not going to do much this summer, mm-hmm. probably, and keep their powder dry. Maybe build up some um, cap space and make a big trade at the deadline. And that's something that I talked about Ken Holland actually about a week and a half ago. Uh, let yeah. slip or talked openly on Oilers now that this was going to be the strategy. And, um, you know, I've been talking about it since then, that this, this does seem to be like by, by far, honestly, the best thing the orders can do. And, and the real advantage of it, and Rashad talked about this, is that um, you, you can accrue some cap space. If you're a little under the cap going forward, you can stay under the cap. Um, you can, at the trading deadline, you have two advantages. You have knowledge of exactly what you need. If Jack Campbell and Stuart Skinner aren't getting the job done at the trade deadline, you then trade for a goalie. You don't know that though in August or J- July. You don't, you know, doing something with a goalie at this point would be it just doesn't make any sense because Jack Campbell could bounce back and you could be counting on him. Um, maybe you have an injury at, at forward. Maybe you have an injury on defense. Maybe Cody Cece has bounced back and is playing the best hockey of his career. Or maybe he doesn't bounce back and you need to bring in a top four D-man, another Eklom kind of trade. Well, then you have the cap space. Um, you know, you you, you don't play it, have to pay that bigger contract over the full year. You've accrued space and you only have to pay it for the final, is it 40 days of the season? So it's you then have the potential to bring in a really good player, um, filling a huge need at a crucial moment. That's obviously the play for the Edmonton Oilers. So I'm sorry, like for all the people hoping, um, as Ken Holland says, yeah, if they're going to make a, a play this summer, it's going to be for a player who's willing to come to Edmonton for quote for peanuts, 
as Holland put it. And that's the only way this is going to happen, as far as I can see. It's going to be a really quiet summer with a few, um, you know, two or three or four. They got to figure out what they do with their vet, you know, their veteran third and fourth line guys. All of those guys are going to sign for a million dollars or they're gone. And they're going to sign a couple more guys like that um, for a million dollars. But they, they, they're going to want to keep some cap space open for the big move that's coming at the trade deadline. Yeah, well, this year at least they have that option. At least it's looking now like they're going to have that option of uh, not having to be uh, bound to the LTIR restriction of just hitting the salary cap every day and never accru- accruing anything. Now, the chances of them accruing very much are small because there's just not going to be a lot left over. And I return to the fact that the Oilers have... Uh, 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 they have... 13 players under contract uh, for uh, over $2.5 million. And every one of those guys was already signed before this summer started. And he's already, all of them are locked up for this upcoming season. And almost all of them are locked up for longer than that. I mean, Kyle Yamamoto and Warren Fogle are the only two that are expiring next summer. If you look just at the Five million dollar and up contracts, which Edmonton has eight. Those eight players are collectively locked up for 36 years with the Edmonton Oilers. Like there's a lot of guys that have six, seven, five years left to run on their contracts, and Drysaddle will be the first of those to expire, and even he's got two years left. And so, you know, they're kind of locked in. This is Ken Holland's team, and this is Ken Holland's team for a while. And when you have 72 million tied up in 13 players, and you have 2 million in dead cap, and you have uh, $850,000 in unpaid bonuses, well, now you're up to 75 million, and you've still only got 13 players. And it sounds like the cap's going to go up to 83.5 on a $1 million bulge. And now you have three RFAs. Uh, I've written about all three of these guys now, Evan Bouchard, uh, Ryan McLeod, and Clem Costin, and all of them deserve a race. And where does it come from? So, I mean, if they move out Yamamoto and don't take a salary back, well, now they have a little more calf space, but they have another hole on the roster. Now they've got 12 players, but maybe you can distribute it a little bit differently. So... Whatever they get in RFAs or, you know, UFAs, sorry, whether they re-sign the guys internally that we've just talked about or whether they go out on the open market, you're going to be looking at guys, you know, almost the PTO style or the NHL minimum type contract like they did last year with Ryan Murray, you know, where, you know, you get what you pay for sometimes. And so, I mean, he's quite restricted. So, uh Due respect yeah. to our, our colleague, Kurt Levins, who says uh, at the end of his nine things yesterday, uh, he says there may be a move out there for Edmonton that on the outside may seem anywhere from a long shot to impossible. It's probably not a specific move that Friedman refers to, rather a mindset which the orders have adopted going in. But Kurt's own opinion is I will not be making many assumptions on the Oilers roster, except that I do not expect Holland to play it safe. So how does he do this with all of these commitments and, you know, no trade, no move, all the clauses that go with it, which is all those $5 million guys for starters. Uh, You know, like he's just dealing with terms of assets. He's dealing with deuces and threes, not aces and kings, right? Yeah, Bruce, it looks like the Yamamoto trade or buyout, which I mm-hmm. think is, it's got to be like 99% to me that that's going to happen, is is that money then goes to the three R- RFAs. It's, it's, yeah. it, it's they figure yeah. out, that's how they mm-hmm. bring back these guys. And then, so then the only other move you can make is CC. And, but can you get a better defenseman than Cody CC right. for three point? Two five million, like it's it's like, can you? And if Cody CC bounces back, um, then you don't need a better defenseman than Cody CC because mm-hmm. because you have a better defenseman mm-hmm. than he was this past year. Right. So I can I like anyone hoping for for more action. It's all it's dependent on moving out CC for a draft pick, which you I think you could do. I think you could trade Cody CC. 
he's a, he's a, a good NHL defenseman at a reasonable price mm-hmm. and get a draft pick. So then you have your, his $3 million that you could try to sign um, a really good, a better defenseman than Cody CC. I just, I don't know that can happen. I, I'm not, you know, who is that defenseman who's going to take that amount of money to come to Edmonton? Maybe, maybe there is someone. In a perfect world, it's Philip Broberg that suddenly rises to the well, that's it, challenge right? and they put him on Nurse's partner on the second pairing, playing his offside and, uh, and he soars and, you know, but, uh, based on Broberg's track record till now where he played very little, he was sheltered pretty heavily last year and played very little against a beat competition and didn't do that well when he did to put him up with there and CC spot who played a hell of a lot against elite competition because it was the nature of the pairing. It was the shutdown pairing. I'm just not sure that the fit is there in a perfect world. That would be wonderful. You know, so that but, would be bold, right? Yes. This would be, if, if you're yes, looking at would. bold, this is the move to make. You've been yeah. bringing Philip Broberg along for f- four or five years now. Mm-hmm. He's, four. he's passed every test, mm-hmm. you know, generally speaking, um, he's kept his head above water at the very least. Mm-hmm. And you think, okay, he's ready to play top four minutes or Brett Kulak is. If, if it's not him, didn't work out that last year with Kulak, but he really stepped up in the plus. So we'll go with Kulak and nurse. And um, so, you know what, if they did that, I wouldn't complain for a second. I think that's a really, you know, they know these players, they're weighing everything and they want, they're going to, they want, so they then use $3 million to try to sign a forward who's a pretty good, you know, a, a winger who can score, mm-hmm. put with dry sidle. If that's your move, move out CC for a pick, you get a draft pick, you, it's, it's rational development on, it's a risky development, yeah. but there's a certain argument for doing that with Broberg or Kulak. And so if that's the play, you know, I think that's, that wouldn't be crazy that I, I could get behind that, but I can, it's, it's just as easy to see them thinking, well, Cody Cece actually played really well two years ago when he was healthy. Mm-hmm. He was good. Mm-hmm. And um, we could use that in the yeah. playoffs. Um, and let's just see how this works out because we could still make that same trade. Uh, we could still, you know, move out CC as the year goes along or um, bring, in a, bring in a winger and we'll just know more and we'll have this cap space. Where we'll accrue this cap space and we'll be ready to go then. And we won't, it's less risky the other way. So either, either way, I could, I, I'd go either way. Would you? Well, that's the the problem is that there's not many ways that they can go to cut salary. The five million dollar contracts are here. The three million dollar ones, I mean, each one is you know would take. It would be hard to get a lot of value back, and you're doing well just to, you know, not have to retain salary. Um, but. You know, I mean, I would feel a lot more comfortable about giving Philip Broberg top four if at any point he'd proven that he could handle top six. Well, what but about he's Kulak been a number Kulak? seven defenseman now for, you know, a year and a half, it feels like. And I mean, he, when he's gotten in there, he's held his own, but they've never sort of really given him a, a big consistent role. I mean, he played with Bouchard for maybe a month this year before the Ekholm trade, and he did okay. But that's, you know, heavily sheltered uh, with DeHarnay as the number seven playing also in that mix. And so it, it, it would be a reach. I mean, if it were to work, if he were able to make the step, it would be a fantastic development. I'm just not sure I'm confident that that would happen in short order. What about Kulak, though, if, if the idea is actually it's Kulak? They, they tried that last those. year. I mean, that, when Keith retired, they you know, when they signed Kulak and he started the year and he was, well, he and Barry both kind of moved up to the second pairing. And yeah. they were okay, but, you know, they weren't outscorers, but they kind of have hung around and held their own. Uh, and that was for, you know, $7 million for the two of them. So, I mean, Kulak, whether you'd want to put him with Nurse and put one of them on the wrong side, I mean that would be the same issue with Grobert too, right? So yeah, there's no there's no simple solutions. Let's put it that way. And they're really in a box in the sense that all of their big contracts are long term. 
and all their expiring contracts are cheap and they can only be basically be replaced with cheap. And then if you move CC, of course, then you're hoping, um, well, maybe you bring in another veteran as your seventh D man, maybe you get mm -hmm. a better one than Ryan Murray, but you, then you're worried about injury, right? right? You're, you're that much closer to being pretty hamstrung on defense. Um, if one or two defensemen gets hurt, which didn't happen last year. So now we right. think they're indestructible. It's not top of mind, but they, as we know, and from past years, it's easy for defensemen to, to one, two, three, four of them to go down all of a sudden. And, uh, you're really counting on your defensive depth. Anyway, it's interesting. Like I've, I've kind of got my head around, I guess, what the fact that the, like this, this plan a, which is to wait for the trading deadline. But there is, I guess, like for for the people who are who do want to see major action this summer, and maybe this is mm -hmm. what Kurt's getting at. I can see that that that's the one move is trading CC mm -hmm. for a pick, using that to, and then counting on Kulak and Broberg to 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 fill his spot. That's the one kind of play that is the wild card if you're looking. So that this would probably be dependent on some winger, a really good winger, um, that you could get. Um, for about three to four million dollars a year, um, maybe with another team eating some cap space or something like that would be the idea, I guess. So, could, such a trade could be out there. Stranger things. Have, I mean, they got in. They got Ackholm Bruce when they mm -hmm. <laughs> they got Ackholm. Yeah, they sure did. And um, they figured that out, but. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know that. Then you're you're blocking, of course, Holloway, Lavoie. If you start to bring in more wingers. Yeah, well, that's that's your other solution. Is one of those young guys comes in and, uh, and tears up the pea patch, you know? Yeah. Like Dylan Holloway, for all the hype this year, you know, he was fairly marginal to me as a player. Made lots of mistakes, took penalties, uh, showed sign flashes, not a lot of finish. Uh, I think he's going to be a good player. I'm not at all sure he's going to be a scoring player. You know, he could be Warren Fogel as far as that goes. Yeah. It's hard to Fair say. Enough. But, you know, he could raise it to uh, uh, <clears throat> to another level, but uh, you can't really count on it. And same with Lavoie. He seems certain to get a shot this year because his waiver exemption has run out. Uh, but if he gets a shot on the third line, I'm not sure we see the play or the fourth line. I'm not sure we see, you know, the upside of a guy, you know, whose big asset is his offense and his shot. So you got, you know, you got to bring him along to the point where you're able to put him up there. But I'm not sure that'll happen any year either. So there's there's lots of questions and uh, uh, lots of. Uh, tricky negotiations ahead for uh, uh, Ken Holland and Bill Scott and all those guys that figure out the salary cap uh, limits. Alrighty. Well, it, uh, we shall see Bruce, but I expect them to go with at this point plan A, unless they find mm -hmm. that really good winger who's willing to take peanuts. So we'll see about that. All right. Bruce, thanks we for solved, talking today. We solved the problems of the orders <laughs> now, have we? I guess so. All right. Well, thanks for listening, everyone. Yeah. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast. <laughs>